I'm Dr. Charles Eaton. This presentation is for the 2017 Annual Scientific Meeting of the American Society for Surgery of the Hand. I'm going to review Dupuytren severity. Now, severity to a certain extent implies risk. I'm going to break down severity by milestones of risk. For example, what's the likelihood that you will in your lifetime develop any signs of Dupuytren disease? What is the likelihood that early Dupuytren disease will progress to the point that it needs treatment for contracture? What's the likelihood that a bent finger can be made straight or almost completely straight by a procedure? What's the likelihood that there will be some loss of that initial correction in the first few months of recovery? What's the likelihood that someone will have a recontracture after an initial period of stability? And what's the likelihood that someone will have long-term stability and biologic inactivity? The biggest risk factor for developing Dupuytren disease in the first place is genetic. If you have a parent or sibling with Dupuytren, you have a 25 to 33 percent lifetime risk of developing it yourself. In the United States, Caucasian Americans are the most commonly affected group, and the prevalence in Hispanic Americans is less than that, prevalence in African Americans even less, and Asian Americans even less. If you have Dupuytren spectrum diseases, letter hose, or frozen shoulder, you're more likely to develop Dupuytren during your lifetime. Age and gender have a significant influence, um, and in general, men develop Dupuytren at an earlier age than women, so um, this graph of the percentage of the population broken down by gender, men uh, have a higher percentage than women at any age group. Um, by age 70, one out of four Caucasian men will have some signs that look like Dupuytren disease in their hands, and by the same age, one out of 10 women will have some signs that look like early Dupuytren disease. Men don't live as long as women, and this curve, these curves change over time, so the gender ratio changes fairly dramatically with age. At age 40, the absolute number of men with Dupuytren disease is 30 times greater than the absolute number of women with Dupuytren disease. And that ratio drops over time. So by age 70, the number of men with Dupuytren uh, outnumber women with Dupuytren by 2 to 1. By age 85 and after, women outnumber men in terms of the absolute number of people with Dupuytren disease. And that's in part due to the fact that in that age group, there are far more women than men. Non-genetic factors can also uh, result in an increased risk of developing what looks like early Dupuytren disease. And this, these effects are not nearly as large as genetics. And they're typically seen when you're looking at people that don't have a family history of Dupuytren disease. So mechanical factors such as uh, within a year of acute trauma or with chronic heavy manual labor and biologic factors diabetes, psoriasis, being underweight, hyperlipidemia, chronic tobacco or alcohol use all increase the risk of developing some sign of Dupuytren disease. Rheumatoid arthritis and being overweight decrease the lifetime risk of Dupuytren compared to the general population. The risk of progressing from nodules to contracture uh, is something that needs to be worked out in greater detail. It's important to understand that of all people with Dupuytren, the great majority don't have any contracture, 80 to 90 percent. And the risk of going from a nodule to a contracture is actually fairly uh, low. So within 10 years after developing the first nodule, one out of 10 people have spontaneous regression. Two out of 10 will have progressed to contracture that's bad enough to require treatment, and the remainder uh, either are stable or don't have enough progression that they need to have some kind of treatment. So not all nodules progress to cords, and not all cords progress to contractures. High risk groups for progression uh, are those with a family history, and this is dose dependent. So compared to people with no family history of Dupuytren disease, people that have Dupuytren in both family lines uh, have their first procedure over 10 years younger, uh, and people with 
dupuytren one family line falls somewhere in between. Prior dupuytren contracture uh, indicates the group of people with more aggressive disease, and people that have treatment on one hand have a 40% risk of developing disease in the other hand within the first five years after their first treatment. External factors, tobacco, alcohol, vibration exposure, do increase the risk of progression, but this is a much smaller effect than age or prior, I'm sorry, than family history or prior contracture. Pseudodupatrin, also known as traumatic palmar fasciitis or non dupatrin disease, is something that needs further investigation. Clinically, it looks just like early dupatrin, but in the context of diabetes or within a year of trauma to that hand, uh, and wrong demographic. So someone who had a hand injury, is a woman, young, no family history of Dupuytren disease. Uh, they may have what looks like Dupuytren disease, but they have a relatively low risk of contracture, and it's not clear whether that actually represents Dupuytren disease or not, or whether it's something that just looks like Dupuytren disease. We'll know when we get a biomarker. The chance of getting a bent finger straight goes down with greater degrees of contracture. And the breakpoints uh, are the composite contracture over 90 degrees, MCP over 50 degrees, and PIP greater than 40 degrees. So as an index of this, the Xiaflex experience has been that, com that comparing these two groups, uh, low degree of contracture for MCP has a 80% chance of getting a straight finger compared to 40% if the MCP is greater than 50 degrees. For the PIP, those numbers are 50% and 25%, a significant influence. In general, the PIP is less likely to get a full correction, repeat fasciectomy, less likely to get a full correction, and biologic factors don't really influence the likelihood of getting a full correction. That includes diathesis uh, and external factors. The likelihood of someone having some of their correction lost in the first few months of recovery uh, is greater for PIP joints in general and for greater degrees of PIP contracture. So contract PIP contracture greater than 60 degrees, which is known to be associated with uh, some degree of incompetence of the extensor mechanism. Redo PIP, open PIP, particularly if the PIP was pinned during a procedure. Small finger, uh, is at greater risk for early loss of correction, people that have more than one ray involved. And again, biologic factors aren't a strong influence uh, in this. So diathesis, age, external factors, and sadly splinting uh, don't affect the risk of uh, some early loss of correction. That, that's a whole nother talk. The chance of developing a recurrence or recontracture after an initial period of stability lasting a year or longer. Uh, the big predictor for this is diathesis factors, uh, but also anatomic factors such as whether you're doing a small finger procedure, if it's a PIP procedure, and in general, uh, fasciectomy lasts uh, over twice as long before recontracture compared to minimally invasive procedures of, of uh, collagenase or needle fasciotomy. Operative factors predicting early recurrence uh, include less than a full correction, and uh, the other is proliferative histology, not that you would make an operative uh, <clears throat> decision based on these, but they predict an earlier recurrence, and uh, external factors including uh, lifestyle factors, um, diabetes, frozen shoulder, peroni, manual labor, don't have clear influences on recurrence rate. Some people will have Dupuytren disease, will have a contracture, and then it will stabilize and not appear to progress during their lifetime. The two uh, influences in this regard are having mild biology that is relatively reactive and relatively self-limited, and so someone who may have provoked the Dupuytren biology but then stops provoking it uh, may have a period of, of relative biologic inactivity. People that have aggressive biology who have a low threshold of, of triggering their Dupuytren disease 
may still become biologically inactive when stress shielding prevents uh, mechanical tension on their cords and that can be either from having a fixed PIP uh, capsule ligamentous contracture that prevents uh, the cord from being stretched or disuse from a severe contracture. So in summary the factors that uh, put people at risk for developing Dubitrin disease in the first place or progressing to the need of contracture those are primarily biologic. The risk factors for getting a straight finger from a procedure or not, or losing some of the initial correction appear to be primarily anatomic and structural. And the risk of having uh, recurrence or progressive recontraction or prolonged stability seem to be a combination of both the biologic predisposition and anatomic factors. All of this would be much more clear if we had a Dupuytren rate biomarker to quantify the severity and to make better predictions and to be able to develop disease specific treatments. And that's what we're doing at the Dupuytren Research Group and uh, thank you very much.